My name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the GRE, the third edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today is our lesson number 142. Day 3142. 3 is to signify the fact that we are in the third edition. Third edition, day 142. We are working on the practice test. Practice test number one that you will find at the very end of the book on page number 363. Section number six. We'll pick up from, we'll start from today from question number six. Question number one through five. The first five questions, five, first five problems we did yesterday. Today we'll pick up from question number six. Question number six, as you can see, is already on the blackboard. We are given an equation for the line. Equa we are told that the equation of the line L is 3x minus 3y equals to 3x minus 2y is equal to 0. We are simply asked to compare the x-intercept versus the y-intercept of the line. Let's, let's see what we can do, shall we? Let's first understand what x-intercept and y-intercept mean. For example, if you have a line, and even though in this particular line we haven't done any work yet, so we don't know what the, what the, what the line would look like, whether it, whether it has a positive slope, whether it's a negative slope, we don't know what its x-intercept are, we don't know its y-intercept, what, 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 what its x-intercept and y-intercept are, obviously, which is what we want to compare. We haven't done any of that. So let's just draw any line at all, any line in general, just to understand what x-intercept means. x-intercept is where the line cuts the x-axis, right here. That's where the x-intercept. x-intercept means where does the line cut x-axis? Well, when the, where the line cuts x-axis, the y-coordinate uh, at that point has to be 0. So let's put it in here, in this equation here. We want to find the x-intercept for, for this equation, 3x minus 3y, 3x minus 2y rather. I don't know why I have to put the y in the parentheses. It's okay. So if you want to find the if you want to find the x-intercept, the y-coordinate has to be zero. So let's put in the y-coordinate equals zero. So we have 3x minus 2y so minus 2 is 2 times 0 equals 0. And 2 times 0 of course is 0, which in turn implies that 3x is equal to 0. But if 3 times x is equal to 0, then obviously it is not 3 that is 0, it must be the x. So that in turn implies that x is equal to 0. Very good. That's our x-intercept. Let's find the y-intercept. The y-intercept is the point where the line cuts the y-axis. And that's where we're going to put x is equal to 0 at this point. Let's put it in here. We should be able to see right away what is going to happen. We shouldn't have to do, the, do this out. We should be able to see what's going to happen here. When we put x is equal to 0, we get 3 times 0 equals minus negative 2y equals 0. 3 times 0 is 0, so it tells us negative 2y is equal to 0. And again, obviously, it's not the negative 2y that is 0. It must be the y. It tells us that y is equal to 0. It turns out that both x-coordinate, both x-intercept and y-intercept, they are both 0. How can that be possible? How can x-intercept and the y-intercept be 0? The value of the x-intercept, x is equal to 0. And Y intercept is zero. How is that possible? Can you figure it out? What is going on here? What is what is going on here is that since they are both equal to zero, since they are both equal to zero, what this implies is that this this in turn implies that the, this this line, this line must this line must go through. Let's go through the origin. I was too lazy. To, I was too lazy to spell out the word through properly. It must go through the origin. The line looks like this. The line looks like this. It goes through the origin. Do you understand? Which is why its x-intercept is zero and its y-intercept is zero. Because the x and the y-intercept, when it goes through the when it goes through the zero, there is no distinction. Both the x-intercept and y-intercept are 0, 0. Technically here we should have figured out the y-coordinate as well, but what we were interested here is what happens except since x-intercept, x is equal to 0, y is equal to 0, because it goes to the origin. And we should be able to see this thing 
had we solved this problem, had we solved this equation and written it in a standard form, which is not required here. We want to find which one is bigger. It turns out they're both equal. The answer is C, and we are done. As far as the problem is concerned, we are done. The answer is C. In case you're curious, I'll give you the percentile before I go to the next part. 33% of the people got this question right. About two-thirds of the people who took the exam got this, when this, when this question appeared on the real exam, about two-thirds of the people got it wrong. What we're gonna do next here is not necessary, but let's do it anyway. Let's rewrite this equation in the standard form. Do you know how to write, do you know how to write an equation in a standard form? A standard form looks like this. Let's put the standard form here. The standard form of a line looks like this. Y is equal to mx plus b, where m is your slope and b is the y-intercept. B is the y-intercept. How do we know that this, this value represents the y-intercept? Because if you put in x equal to 0, 0 times m, doesn't matter what the slope is, 0 times anything is 0, this will drop out and y will equal b. So in a situation where it does not go through the intercept, where, 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 situ situation where the, line, where the line does not go through the origin, that is, if it doesn't go through the origin, we can figure out what the y-intercept is by putting the value of 0 here for x. You see? In the other situation, like here, if it, if it likes this, for example, if you put in x equal to 0, or rather, x equals 0 right here, this is where x is equal to 0, and we can figure out what the y-coordinate is. The y-coordinate would be this, this thing right here, and that's your b. That's, that's the intercept. But here we are dealing with here we are dealing with a situation where we already know that the line goes through the origin. So let's see what it looks like. Let's erase all of this thing. Let's write let's write this equation 3x minus 2y in a standard form. Do you understand? The standard form should look like this. We need to isolate we need to isolate the y. So let's bring the 3x to both other side. So that implies the negative 2y must equal negative 3x. Let's divide both sides by negative 2y because we want the y by itself. Negative 2 divided by negative 2 is just going to give us the y and negative 3 divided by negative 2 will give us 3 halves x. 3 halves x plus what? Where is the b? The y-intercept. Well, we already know from doing the work that y-intercept was 0. So that should be a surprise to us. The y-intercept was 0. So here, here, when x is equal to 0, y would equal, when x is equal to 0, it's going to be 3 over 3 times 0 plus 0. And that tells you when x is equal to 0, where is x equal to 0? x is equal to 0 along the y-axis. And we're trying to find this distance. We're trying to find it. We're trying to find it. And we did found it, but we found it to be 0. We found it to be 0 because it, the line is sitting here. And secondly, it was a negatively slope line. Because we can see here, it's a positively slope line. Slope is 3 halves. What happens when what happens when when x is equal to when x is equal to two? You see when x is equal to two we have a two at the bottom here, watch what happens. Y would equal, or we can put it right here. When x is equal to two, instead of redoing it, let's put x equal to two here. When x is equal to two, what's gonna happen? This this thing doesn't exist, it's zero, do you understand? When x is equal to two y is equal to 3. What does it tell us? Not only it goes to the origin, not only it goes to the origin, but when x is equal to 2, 1, 2, y is equal to 3. y is equal to 3. 1, 2, 3. Right here. Which means the slope of the line is 3 halves. But all of that work was not necessary. What was necessary, what was necessary here was to be able to recognize right away that this line goes to the origin and because it goes through the origin, it has the, both the x-intercept and y-intercept 0. 0, 0. It goes through the origin. There is no distinction here. There is no distinction here between... There is no distinction here between the x-intercept and the y-intercept because if you ask somebody the question, where does the line cut the x-axis, the answer would come back at... They will tell you the line cuts the x-axis at 0, 0. You ask again, where does the line cuts the y-axis? And again, the answer would be, it cuts the y-axis at 0, 0. 
it cuts x-axis and both y-axis at the same point right here goes it goes like that where does it cut the x-axis it cuts the x-axis as 0 0 where does it cut the y-axis it cuts the y-axis as 0 0 it cuts the x-axis at the origin it cuts the y-axis at the origin it's sitting at the origin and therefore the answer will see because the x coordinate x intercept rather and the y intercept they're both equal they're both zero Number seven, that was too much explanation. Sometimes it's, it's better not to do so much. Number seven, way too much explanation. It says n is a n is a positive integer. We are told that we have some quantity n. We are told it is positive integer. And we are told that it is divisible by six. It is evenly divisible by six. You understand? Column A. We have to compare the remainder when x is divided by 12 and column B. We have to compare the remainder when x is divided by 18. So let's do that, shall we? We know it's a positive integer and we also know that it is divisible by 6. It is divisible by 6. That we do know. Question is, if we were to find such a number, something that is divisible by 6, the question is, what would what will we get for remainder? What will we get for remainder when we divide it by 12? And what will we get the remainder when we divide the same number? by 18. Well the simplest, the quickest, the easiest, the most economical way here as always is to plug in numbers. Let's just plug in number. Let let n. I switch between x and n. Don't fuss about it please. It's not a big deal. It's not the end of the world if I if I inadvertently switch the symbol from n to x. Don't fuss about it, okay? You know what I meant? Let x equal to what do you want to plug in for x? We'll plug in something simple, something start out with something sweet. We know it has to be it has to be divisible by six. That's the condition we have to meet. Question is what's the remainder when you divide by twelve? So why not plug in twelve? When x is equal to twelve, when you divide by twelve, the remainder is going to be zero. Of course, this is the tricky part. What happens? What happens when you if x is equal to twelve? What happens when we try to divide twelve by eighteen? What's the remainder? Can you tell? This is where the tricky part comes in. What's the remainder? What's the remainder? What's the remainder when 12? What What is the remainder when when 12 is divided by 18? Which is what we're doing here. 12 is divided by 18, not the other way around. How many 18? How many 18 does 12 have? 12 has no 18s. It's too puny to have any 18s. It, it doesn't have any 18. It has zero 18s. It has zero 18s. Therefore, 18 times zero is zero, and the remainder is going to be 12. Remainder is going to be zero, 12. When we divide, when we divide 12 by 18, we have a remainder of 12. It's a tricky one. I know that it was not an ordinary one, but you should understand that the, if you try to divide, if you, if you try to divide 12 by 18, you're going to have a remainder of 12. Before the remainder was zero. Here the remainder was zero. When x is equal to 12, when x is equal to 12, when you divide by 12, the remainder is zero. When you divide by 18, the remainder is 12. So so far the answer is a. Let's pick something else. This. This time let's do the other way around. Let, let x be 18. If x is 18, what's the remainder when we divide 18 by 12? If we divide 18 by 12, how many 12 does 18 have? 18 has 1 12. Well, if we take away 12, we have a remainder of 6. So when we divide 18 by 12, when we divide 18 by 12, we have a remainder of 6. But when we divide 18 by 18, when we divide, when we divide 18. When 18 is divided by 18, the remainder is going to be 0. You see, before the answer was A, now the answer is B. And if we can do it that far, if you can if you can make the journey this far, then we are done. That's it. We don't need to waste any more time. We, need, we don't need to invest any more time in this question on the exam, in the real exam. We're getting a conflicting answer and therefore the answer is D. The next part that we're going to do, the next part that we're about to do, is purely for learning purposes. As I said already, what we are about to do is not necessary for the real exam. What we could have done here is to find a scenario, 
find a scenario. We found one scenario where the answer is A. We found another scenario where the answer is B. Can you think of a scenario where the answer would turn out to be C? And if you want to do it yourself, you can do it. I'll give you a second. Pause the video and see if you can think of a scenario where the answer would turn out to be C. Do it yourself. In order, for, in order for the answer to be C, what we need to find is some quantity, some number, that is a multiple of both 12 and 18. If we can think of some number that is a multiple of both 12 and 18, then when we divide that number by 12, we're going to get a remainder of 0 because it's a multiple of 12. And when we divide the same number by 18, we'll get a remainder of 0 because it's a multiple of 18. Can you think of such a number? Can you think, and as a matter of fact, can you think of a smallest number, a smallest number that is both a multiple of 12 and 18? First of all, what do we call such a what do we call such a concept? Does it have a name? Something that is a multiple of both 12 and 18, and it's the smallest such number. It is called such such a such a concept is called the least common multiplier (LCM). The least common multiplier, a multiplier that is common to both of them. Not only it's a common to both of them, not not only it's a multiple of 12 and 18, but it also happens to have another characteristic that it is the least such number, smallest such number that you can think of, hence, hence the least common multiplier. This is how we find it. This is how we find it. We put a 12 here and we put an 18 here and we ask ourselves, we ask ourselves what's the smallest prime number that you can think of, smallest, it has to be a prime number, smallest prime number that you can think of, that is where both of these are divisible by it. And, and such, and the answer is 2. 2 is the smallest prime factor. When we divide 12 by 2, we get a 6. When we divide 18 by 2, we get a 9. Again, the same question. What's the smallest prime number, or smallest prime factor of both 6 and 9? The smallest prime factor they share. Why the smallest one? Well, because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the least. The least prime factor, or the smallest prime factor, is 3. When you divide 6 by 3, we get a 2. When we divide 9 by 3, we get a 3. And that's it. That's where the story begins. That's where the story ends. Because now we have... Both of these are prime factors, so we have to stop here. So the least common multiplier here would be 2 times 3, which is 6. 6 times 2 is eight. 6 times 2 is uh, 12, and 12 times 3 is 8. 12 times 3 is 36. The least common multiplier here would be 2 times 3, 2 times 3 times 2 times 3, which is 36. So if you were to put 36 here, let x equal to 36. If we were to put x equal to 36, then 36, when 36, when we divide 12 by 12, it goes 3 times, exactly. The remainder is 0. When we divide 36, when we divide 36, remainder, when 36 is divided by 18, it's going to be 0 also. Because 36 is 2 times 18. Now the remainder is 0, remainder is 0, the answer is C. We have three nice scenario here, nicely laid out, A, B, and C. But in the real exam, we don't have to find three, three different scenarios. We just have to find the contradiction. As long as you find the two contradictory answers, you're done. Then we were done at that point. In the first scenario, the answer was A. In the second scenario, the answer was B. And therefore, the correct answer is D. The correct answer is D. I'm curious as to what the percentile was here. Oh, no kidding. What do you think the percentile was? Obviously, majority of the people got it wrong. 60% of people got this question wrong in the real exam. Let's do number 8. Let's do number 8. Number 8. We have one o one minus x over x minus one. We are told is equal to one over x. And all we want to compare are these two quantities. Column A, we have what do we have in column A? Number eight. We have just x, only x. And in column B, we have negative one half. That's what we're going to compare. Keep that in mind. Let's begin the show, shall we?
let's begin the show. What can we do here? Well, the simplest, easiest, quickest, the most economical uh, way here would be to simply do it algebraically. It will be very quick. You will see in a second, it will be very quick. But before we do the algebra work, we must pay attention to some minor de minute details. Actually, they are not minute, they are actually quite glaring, and yet people miss them. When something, when something appears in the denominator, some quantity, some expression here, you must understand that if somebody tells you, if somebody tells you that I have some y, which is equal to 1 over x minus 5, just for an example, we must immediately understand that here y cannot, rather here in this case, in this case, in this case, x cannot equal to 5. It's not possible for x to be 5 because if x were 5, if x were 5, we'll end up with 5, 1 over 5 over 5, 1 over 0, in which case y would be undefined. It's infinity, it's undefined. We can't have that. So when, somebody, when something like this appears, we must immediately realize that x cannot equal 5. Here, what do you see in the denominator? We see two quantities in the denominator. We see x minus 1, which means this implies that x minus 1 cannot equal to 0, because we cannot have 0 at the bottom, which in turn implies that x in the here cannot equal to 0, or rather x cannot equal to 1. Can you bring negative 1 to that side? x cannot equal to 1, because if x happens to be 1, because if x happens to be 1, we'll end up with a 0 at the bottom. 1 minus 1 is 0. x cannot equal to 1. And on this side, x cannot equal to 0. So there are two conditions we must satisfy. x cannot equal 1 and x cannot equal 0. We have to keep this in mind, which is why a lot of the people are going to get this question wrong. When we finish the exam, I'll give you the percentile and you will see at that time that three quarters of the people, when this question appeared in the real GRE, three quarters of all the people who were taking the exam got this question wrong. They got this question wrong because they were not paying attention to these details. X is not allowed in this equation, in this equation, X is not allowed to be zero. No, no. X is not allowed to be, X is not allowed to be one. These two conditions must always be fulfilled. Let's make a note of these two conditions aside here so we have the room to work on here, okay? So, let's put it here. X cannot equal 1 and X cannot equal 0. We must satisfy these two conditions because when we finish working here, we're going to have values for X. And we have to understand that anything that says that X is equal to 1 is not acceptable. Anything that says that X is equal to 0 is not acceptable. So let's begin the process. Let's begin the process. We're going to cross multiply. We're going to cross multiply, we have x minus 1 on this side, on the bottom, we have 1 minus x, so we're going to cross multiply, when we cross multiply, we end up with x times 1 minus x equals 1 times, and we're not going to put 1 here, it's 1 times that, which is just x minus 1. I hope you're okay so far, the rest is very easy, Just we just have to remember that. So let's begin, 1 times x is x, x times minus x is going to be negative x squared, and here we get x minus 1. Okay, what, what happens? So we have x here on this side, we have x here on this side. If we subtract x from both sides, x will drop out. And what do we get? end up here? What we end up here is that negative x squared is equal to negative 1. Let's multiply both sides of the column, let, but multiply both sides of the equation by negative 1. If we multiply both sides of the equation by negative 1, negative and negative will become positive and x squared becomes negative 1 times negative 1 which is positive 1. If x squared is equal to positive 1, that in turn implies that x has to be positive or negative 1. If x squared, if x squared is 1, x has to be either positive 1 or negative 1. Because in both cases, in both cases, you see x squared is 1. So in both cases, whether, whether x is positive 1 or negative 1, when we square it, negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1. So in both cases, whether x is positive 1 or negative 1, in both cases, x squared is positive 1. Therefore, that's the solution. x equal to either positive 1 or negative 1. So the mistake the people are going to make is this. I'm going to show you the mistake for error part first and then we'll do it properly. So the people go this far. People get this far and they said to themselves, they said to themselves, well, x is either positive 1 or negative 1. And they, then they say to themselves, well, if it's positive 1, then positive 1 is more than negative half. If positive 1 
is more than negative half, in this case the answer is A. Well, if it's negative 1, the negative 1 is less than negative half, in that case the answer is B. Since we get a conflicting answer, they conclude that the answer is correct answer is D. But all of that is wrong. All of that is wrong. Why is it wrong? Because it's not allowed to be 1. X cannot be positive 1. In this scenario, X cannot be positive 1. So even though the algebra tells us that this is possible, we have to look at this thing and understand that it will become undefined when X is that's not an acceptable solution. It's a solution only in theory, but not acceptable solution. So X cannot be positive 1. Here, the only value that X is allowed to be is negative 1. The only value even though it tells us x is either positive 1 or negative 1, but x cannot be positive 1. So the only value that x is allowed to be is negative 1. x is equal to negative 1. And which quantity is bigger? Negative 1 or negative half? Of course, negative half is bigger. The correct answer here is b, not d. Because x equals to negative 1. Not positive and negative 1. x just equals negative 1. x can only equal negative 1. And as I told you before, almost three quarters of people missed it. The percentile here was 26. Only 26% of people got it right. That was number eight. My plan was also to do number nine. Should we get it out of the way? No, we'll do number nine and number ten together, okay? Because number nine is also something that needs to talk about. Let's not do it in a hurry. We'll do number nine and number ten together tomorrow. And then day after tomorrow, we'll do number eleven, which is also sheer hell. Do you understand? We'll do them day after tomorrow, number ten and eleven. We'll do number nine tomorrow, the very last one in the quantity comparison. Alright? Bye now.